Welcome, good afternoon. We're gonna go ahead and give some time for everyone to join us uh, over the next couple of minutes. I know this has been a wonderful couple of days coming together again for the National Minority Quality Forum annual summit on health disparities and health brain trust. Uh, we're doing it a little different this year, but I know these conversations continue to make an impact. Um, so thank you. We're gonna go ahead and take a couple minutes. If you're just joining us, please feel free uh, to look where the Q&A is, check the chat. We've been able to share uh, links on our panelists that you'll learn more about. Uh, so feel free to take a couple of minutes and um, we will go ahead and get started. So I wanna welcome you. Um, again, my name is Shiria Thompson and I am the founder and principal of the IRIS Collaborative, um, but I am a proud board member of NNQF um, Advisory Board and an inaugural member of the 40 Under 40 uh, Leaders of Health. That was the 2016 class. And we are just honored to have uh, 200 uh, leaders coming together that will be recognized uh, tomorrow evening. So thank you for coming back and continuing to learn and share your best practices in your community. Uh, we know that today this session I think is going to leave you with some opportunities to take um, innovations and solutions to building healthy sustainable communities in your neighborhood as well. So as I said in the chat, if you'd like to connect with fellow attendees, that's excellent. And we have the link to our panelist bios. But we also want to make sure that you know where to submit questions. So please use the Q&A box. We will not be taking questions from the chat. And we are going to open up with some pretty dynamic presentations and then go into a conversation panel and then hear from you with your questions. If you need technical help, please feel free to email 2020 Summit Register at NNQF. So I have the pleasure of working with Courtney uh, Roberts, who you're going to learn more from the Director of Global Health of Philanthropic Partnerships at Eli Lilly and Company. Uh, I was fortunate enough to learn more about the partnership work that they are doing in Indianapolis uh, with Dr. Lisa Staten and principal um, investigator of uh, the project. She serves as the PI. She's also the associate professor chair of the Department of Social and Behavioral Health Sciences at Indiana University. And in addition, we're going to hear from the community perspective with Ms. Patrice uh, Duckett. She is the dip in North, near Northwest, excuse me, community resident and dip in steering committee member and executive director uh, of Faye Bickard Glick Neighborhood Center. Uh, each of these leaders are going to bring that multi partner approach. And I think you're going to learn more about what they do, but also how it can apply to your work. The panelists that you're going to hear from today uh, that have been doing the work in community, just like many of you that may be here, uh, include Ashley Gervitz. Uh, she's the Dip In Neighborhood CHW Supervisor. For those of you that might be new to this work, that's a community health worker. Uh, she's the Chief Executive Officer and Executive Director of United Northeast Community Development Corporation Alliance for Northeast Unification. Uh, we also have uh, Alyssa Jessup, who Alicia Jessup, excuse me, who's joining us as the Dip In CHW Manager, Manager uh, Nursing Clinical Care of the Eskenazi Health Center, and then we have Miss Shanira Zapata, uh, who is the Dip In Certified Community Health Worker of the Eskenazi Health Center as well, and then finally we're going to hear from Mr. Ron Rice. Uh, who is the Dippin Near Northwest Community Resident, Dippin Steering Committee Member, and North, Near Northwest, excuse me, Community Builder. So we've got a robust uh, agenda, and I'm going to go ahead and get started by sharing the screen with Lisa. Uh, Dr. Staten's going to tell you more about the incredible work that they're doing to improve community health. Dr. Lisa? Thank you, Sharia. Um, so we're gonna get started and let um, Courtney Roberts go ahead and I'm um, making sure I can advance my slides there. There we go. 
and have Courtney Roberts kick it off and talk about um, how we got here. The project, the dip-in project was funded by the Eli Lilly Corporation and company. And I, and I think it's important to understand how, how that even came about. Great, thank you, Lisa. Thanks for that introduction. And thanks to all of you for inviting us here today to be part of this really important an exciting conversation. I'm Courtney Roberts and I lead Eli Lilly and Company's philanthropic global health partnerships. And I hope what you'll see today is that when all of us come together and we bring our collective resources, the private sector, the public sector, the academic sector, and actually let the community lead, we can make impactful and sustainable change. So I am going to start um, with the big picture because I think it's always helpful to see how this work is really part of the fabric of our company at, at Eli Lilly. And our commitment as a corporate citizen comes directly from our founder where Colonel Eli Lilly charged all of us to take what you find here and make it better and better. And 144 years later, we still live by this motto as a company. And because of that charge, our journey in global health started very early on in our company's history with product donations. Um, after the 1914 earthquake in San Francisco, Lilly sent medical supplies by cable car to help those in need. And today we continue to donate product in response to natural disasters and humanitarian crises. But in 2017, we transformed our global health work to bring the resources of the entire company to bear to improve the health around the world. We launched, we launched what we call Lilly 30 by 30, which is a company-wide commitment to expand access to quality health care for 30 million people living with limited resources around the world by the year 2030. Next slide, Lisa. So this is a big, bold, aspirational goal, and I think we can get there. Uh, since this is a company-wide initiative, this will take all aspects of our company in order to bring this to fruition. And we plan to get there by focusing in three specific areas. The first is through our pipeline, discovering new medicines and exploring our current portfolio um, and shelved assets to find new indications for diseases that disproportionately affect people living with limited resources. The second is through programs that um, we will strengthen existing business solutions and create new ones that help improve access to Lilly medicines. And the third, which is where we'll spend all of our time today is through our partnerships, building philanthropic partnerships that actually strengthen health systems, increase access to medicines and improve care. Most of these partnerships focus on NCDs, particularly diabetes and cancer. Next slide, Lisa. This is a snapshot of our, oh, back one more slide. This is a snapshot of our, back one more slide. I it's apologize, okay. I will get this figured out here shortly. It's, it's okay. This is a snapshot of our current global health portfolio. And you'll see that um, dip in is part of truly a global effort. effort. We've got, global health partnerships in India, Mexico, Kenya, South Africa, Ghana. Um, we're in the process of establishing a partnership in China. And then we've got the partnership here in the US to address diabetes right here in the city of Indianapolis. Next slide. Now, you might ask, how can you do global health work in Indianapolis, which is in the US, which is a high income country? And well, we all know that people everywhere lack access to quality care, regardless of whether they live in a high income or low income country. And this certainly isn't news, but it's even more evident in 2020 where people of color in the US are being disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 and the lack of health equity more broadly is being illuminated. And this global pandemic has also kind of erased those lines between what happens within the US and what happens outside of the US. And so global health is actually really local health. And as part of Lilly's global health commitment, we committed to also turning our focus to our own backyard right here in the city of Indianapolis. And so you'll see that um, this map that you're looking at right now is a map of life expectancy within Indianapolis. And you'll see that as you travel 
from the northern suburbs south to downtown, over the course of 28 miles, life expectancy drops by 14 years. Next slide, Lisa. Life expectancy in the northern suburbs is equivalent to Switzerland and Japan. And life expectancy closer to the center of the city drops by 14 years and is the equivalent to countries like Iraq and Uzbekistan. And that's almost 10 years lower than the US average. So when deciding how to approach this global health diabetes work in Indianapolis, after meeting with many city stakeholders, it became very clear that we had to address diabetes at the neighborhood level. And with that, the Diabetes Impact Project or Di Diabetes Impact Project Indianapolis Neighborhoods or what we call Dip In was born. Next slide, Lisa. So before I turn it over to um, Lisa Staten to talk about the details of Dip In, I do want to acknowledge that as part of Lilly's global health work, we are very aware of the affordability challenges around insulin and we take this very seriously as a company. Uh, we've developed a broad suite of affordab affordability options for people. Uh, the first thing that I would like to highlight is um, the Lilly Insulin, the Insulin Value Program. We announced this at the outset of COVID. This is for anyone who is uninsured or underinsured. If you contact the, the Lilly Diabetes Solutions Center, we will provide Lilly Insulin for $35 a month, irrespective of the number of vials you're taking. And while this was initially announced, uh, to provide temporary relief during COVID, we've just announced in September that this solution will be made permanent. We're also doing other things like capping out-of-pocket costs at the pharmacy level. We've introduced LifePro, a lower priced insulin at 50%, and we've also increased our donations to free clinics. Finally, um, this, I'd like to highlight the senior savings model, which has the potential to be incredibly impactful. The administration has launched a new program in Medicare starting next year that will cap seniors' insulin expenses at $35 a month total. And that's not just Lilly insulin, but all insulin. Um, the open enrollment period for Medicare Part D starts October 15th. So it's really important that we make seniors aware of this program so they can choose the right plan. Next slide, please, Lisa. So just to finish off, we've got a dedicated Solution Center staffed by 30 professionals. The number is here on the screen. If you call this number, they will walk through those solutions with you and help match people up with the solution that works for them. We have worked um, closely with our community health workers in all of the different neighborhoods um, to make them aware of these solutions so they can also work with the residents so they're aware of these solutions as well and know how to best utilize them. So. With that, I would love to turn it over to Lisa and the rest of the team to get into the details of dip in. Thank you, Courtney. Um, I, I also want to add my thanks to the organiz organizers of the forum for inviting us and allowing us to present on this project. I think it's a pretty special project uh, where, as you saw the title, the multi-partnerships, we really do have a broad range of partnerships involved. And so um, it is truly something I can talk for hours about. I will do my best to stay in my time limit to, so that you can really hear from the folks who are really working in all of the neighborhoods. So what is dip in dip in I, before we get started I want to kind of just remind folks or update folks if you're not really up on the statistics related to diabetes that globally estimates for diet di for di diabetes excuse me for those who are both diagnosed as well as undiagnosed is about 9.3% and in the US that estimate it raises up into about 13% then as you go to Indiana, our estimates are at 15%. But when you focus in on just the areas, the neighborhoods work that we work with for the dip in project, our new estimates are about 23%. Um, and hopefully that highlights, that highlights the importance of this project is we really need to get a handle on that and figure out how we can, how we can stop that. Um, those high rates. So the Diabetes Impact Project, as Courtney mentioned, we fondly call Dip End, is a five-year project that began in 2018. We are just about finishing. I was just told today we're at three and a half years. 
and um, it, the time has flown. And the project is a $7 million project and we are working with three neighborhood areas. And you can see I capitalized with because it truly is the, the, at the heart of the project that we are collaborating closely with the neighborhoods. And I'll be talking a little bit more about that um, throughout. And where are we located? So for those of you who aren't familiar with Indiana, Indianapolis is, and Marion County are located at the center of the state. And highlighted here in the map, you can see the general area of where we are. I know that probably couldn't pick it out on the map, but this is the general geographic location. And how did we pick those areas? Um, First of all, we were able to look at electronic medical record data uh, modeling from the CDC to look at where the prevalence, what the prevalence distribution was within the city of Indianapolis. And we identified a number of high prevalence areas. We also then focused on areas with similar socioeconomic conditions. So predominantly lower income areas. Uh, and we also wanted to make sure that we had a, we, that we really were working in areas with a diverse um, racial and ethnic composition. Uh, our total, if you combine all three of the areas are about 83% people of color. And we have some areas where we have predominantly older population and other areas that have a much younger population. And so from a, from a research challenge, that's huge, but we really wanted to make sure it was reflective of all, all the populations in the urban area. And um, one of the next criteria were that we had a federally qualified health community health center located within the boundaries of each area. And that is um, where we work with Eskenazi Health, which is our public hospital system. And there'll be a couple people on the panel who can talk about that. Um, and then the third area, which is probably least usual in selecting an area, but is to me one of the most important was that we picked areas where there were active community partnerships and who had been working with some of the key stakeholders were involved in this initial decision. So ideally we would have had residents at the table at day one, but we in, we focused on identifying areas and then we were able to go out, talk with people before funding happened to see if there was interest in partnering and working together on this and, and listening to what were the, 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 the requirements and suggestions and needs of the community before we even had a funded and des totally designed project. I wanna highlight here, given the, um, the topic of the conference about democratization of data, this is a portal, a community data portal that was developed as part of the project. If you can see at the bottom, I'm not sure that might cut off a little bit on your screen, each of our three areas, it's a portal that's available for community residents. It's brand newly launched. Um, some of our folks may not have totally seen the finished product yet, but it is um, hopefully utilized. Um, the go our goal is that the community residents can use this for many purposes. So the project, the overall dip in project has three aims, um, everything from primary to tertiary prevention. And we'll start with, so aim one is to reduce complications, improve quality of life of people living with diabetes. Then aim two, we focus on those folks who don't know that they have diabetes or who are, have prediabetes by raising awareness in the, in the neighborhoods. And then our third aim is about the prevention focus, which to me is one of our major, major um, focus areas. And that's with the goal of ch making changes at the environmental systems and policy level. I will point out, you'll see pictures of members of our steering committees included, as well as our community health workers. Um, we do have three uh, three steering committees, one in each of those three areas, each of the communities, and I say communities because they're clusters of neighborhoods, are very distinct and are driven, and so decisions are being made um, separately for each of the three areas. Our first uh, aim is about helping people who have diabetes live longer lives and reduce their complications. This is our main partner here is with Eskenazi Health. We, through the DIPM project, have um, funded three community health workers and Eskenazi Health has matched that. So we have a total of six community health workers that are um, affiliated with the, the local community health centers. They don't sit at the clinics, especially now in time of COVID, obviously, 
but even before COVID, their goal was to be out and visiting people in their homes and really understanding what were barriers to, uh, to being able to control diabetes. So the, their clients focused on people who had a hemoglobin A1Cs over 7.8, and who have, and we know that many times people can't focus on their own health when they're worried about things like evictions or paying their utility bills. So the community health workers have been huge supports in making sure that people's social needs get addressed as well as helping them with understand, um, making sure that things like equipment are functioning and things for glucose monitoring. Our next aim, which is focused on uh, really raising that awareness, hope, making sure that we allow people to know if they are at risk so that they can make changes in life and do things in order to potentially prevent um, developing diabetes from prediabetes, as well as reducing complications in the long run. And the way we've done that is the three steering committees identified community organizations within their areas that they wanted to work with. And we have um, put neighborhood community health workers in those organizations. Their goals are to be key resource areas to connect um, residents to services and to work closely with the steering committees. And we have a panelist who can talk about that uh, aspect more. The final aim is our primary prevention aim, which is, driven prim is mainly driven by our steering committees. We have utilized, we have gathered a lot of data. Um, sometimes that can be frustrating for our community or partners because it's just more data collection, but we had done some household surveys, random household surveys, and um, as well as meet and talk with the local residents to get a handle on some, some specific areas related to diabetes prevention. And we then took the information from the random household surveys and put those into infographics and um, and shared the, the general data with the, each of the steering committees. And the steering committees then decided which specific area that they wanted to target. Um, and those different areas include, one area has selected physical activity infrastructure and opportunity. Another area has um, selected healthy food access. And the final one, the third area selected stress. And right now they're all in the process of creating their working groups inviting in other members of the community that is working in those areas, and then um, starting to identify their specific strategies. And then this is my last slide. Um, I just wanted to highlight, these are some of the many formal partnerships that are part of the project, meaning those that are, um, are connected in a, in a contractual way or some sort, but we have a many, many, many other organizations that are also at the table working on this project with us. So now I want to hand this off to Patrice Duckett or as our, to get the community perspective. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about the history of how we got started in our neighborhood. So we are the near northwest side of Indianapolis. And for me, I was born and raised in the neighborhood that I'm currently in, literally came from my hospital here in Indianapolis and right back to my neighborhood and I haven't left, um, maybe a different house, but haven't actually left the neighborhood. And so um, I've always been engaged in the work. Um, our community is very active. We are a MLK or Martin Luther King Street uh, neighborhood. So that means that we are very engaged in our community and have a voice and a stakehold on what is happening in our space. So at the beginning of this work, um, we were asked to come to the table, a few residents, to talk about what we actually wanted to see of this grant or this opportunity. And um, because we are one of those communities that are very engaged and, and um, very active, we get approached a lot around some of the work um, with funders who want to come in and, in a sense, use us for data or use us for um, leverage or even use us just because we know that we can do a program successfully. And so when we sat down with the funders this time and the partners, Eli Lilly and others, and um, we were very cocky with our ask. Um, we, 
uh, wanted to go for the gusto because we felt that if it was going to happen, you were going to listen to us. And some of the things we asked for, well, I would say most of the things we asked for, such as changing our funding source from three years to five years, making sure that everyone that was a part of this either were hired in from their neighborhood or lived very close into the neighborhood or very comfortable in the neighborhood, making sure that there was resident engagement in the steering pieces of it or the leadership part of it, that residents led the work. Um, we also talked about funding for uh, participation from community uh, stakeholders or residents instead of volunteering, actually giving them some type of uh, compensation for their work so that there is more investment um, and then making sure that the investment was intentional and allowing us to expand it as we go along the way. Um, I was, I could say I was very cocky in that meeting. Um, I just figured if we're gonna go, we're gonna go with what we want. Um, surprisingly, uh, Lily and uh, Fairbanks and others actually came and provided us with, I would say almost 90% of everything that we asked for. Um, and it's been such a great, opportunity for us. So once we, the ask was there, the funders being intentional about what they were trying to do and trying to make sure that they are diminishing the uh, diabetes and, uh, the, the, and improving the health of our community actually supported us. And so with that ask, we were able to have a great impact um, in our community. One, we started hiring individuals in our community. Uh, we really looked at um, the overall conversation in our neighborhood. People started to uh, come around and really participate in this work. Uh, one of the things that really helped us in our community was the marketing intentionality. If you see the, the, uh, the banner that's up now, these are all residents or very engaged individuals in our community. So when people were walking through our area, are they seeing the banners around dip in, they can uh, relate that to individuals that lived in the area because they were hardworking, they were very engaged. You would see them out cleaning a street or um, actually um, passing out flyers or calling you and telling you to come to a meeting. And that helped tremendously on getting some of our survey uh, information in. It also helped with um, getting people comfortable with individuals knocking on their doors, asking them personal questions around their diabetes. And then it just brought that, that comfortability to make sure that this is, this is and will be a success. So we went from just the story of you know, we know we are the best and you're gonna access for work or access for support to, okay, so now we need to ask you or, or give you what we want and, and list our demands. Then we started seeing impact happening rapidly within this almost three year time frame, And now we're in a place where we are moving from an ask to an impact to a leverage. So we take our grant and our opportunity with uh, these partners, and we are leveraging that to be to bring in bigger opportunities in our community. One of the things you've seen in the presentation was the the despairing numbers of age of a community where in my community where I live at, I know that I possibly could pass away 10 years earlier than the individuals that are at least five miles up from me. And so now we're looking at how do we stop that and how do we deter that from our community? So we leverage this partnership to even go further around health, um, not just talking about diabetes, but now we're, we have a farm in our community. We are working on having a mobile farm uh, where we are uh, utilizing a bus to take vegetables around to individuals in our neighborhood. We are advocating to take over our community center, or not a community center, I'm sorry, our um, city ran park and their center to make sure that we have our own fitness center within our community because we're in a minority area that does not have that. And so that this opportunity to talk about and really look at health from a different perspective and, and starting with diabetes has now uh, flourished into health overall. Um, in our city, we have really focused on a lot of quality of life plan type of processes. Every one of our neighborhoods in our city has done this. And one of the things that has been prevalent in all of our neighborhoods is that health has been the last uh, initiative to focus on. One, because we can never figure out how to touch it. Or two, we couldn't get the engagement or the, the, the work put in from the residents to make it a, a substantial difference. But with this program, this opportunity, our community has been able to do that and we have excelled in our health initiatives across the board. Um, and then the final thing that we've been able to do 
with our leverage is that we have started to create a collective impact model, which brings in multiple funders to the table, coming up with commonality as far as goals and opportunities, and then actually looking at how do we successfully complete those on a long-term scale. Uh, we've used collective model in a smaller sense, but now we are able to do it in a larger sense um, that will definitely show impact so that in my community, I am, I am happy to say that I can live in a community and I will live just as long as my neighbor is seven or five miles away. Yes. Shira, that is all I have. Well, I like that. Again, um, making sure, right, that you have the same opportunity to live as your neighbors. Um, and I know we're going to hear about the impact that you just shared um, from a couple of key members of the community. Um, so we're excited to welcome the voices of Alicia, Ashley, Ron, and Shay. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and actually stop sharing so we can see their lovely faces and we can kind of get into learning more about the incredible work that you do. Um, so feel free to uh, think of the questions as we start the panel off with our discussion. If you think of something, if you've got a question about work that you're doing, I love that you talked about the collective impact model. I've used it in breast cancer. Someone might be watching thinking about how can I use it for you know, hypertension or another disease state? Um, so definitely get those questions in the, in the Q&A box for us. And we're gonna go ahead and open up with learning a little bit more from the panelists about those specific focus areas that Dr. Lisa mentioned, which one are you working in? And if you can tell us a little bit more about your role with DIPIN. So we can start with uh, Alicia. Hello, so I am Alicia Jessup. I'm the nursing clinical manager for uh, Eskenazi Health in Indianapolis. Uh, within that role, I do lead the community health workers uh, that we currently have uh, for Eskenazi. Um, would you like me to talk about a little bit about what they do or just introduce myself? Well, we'd love to hear about what you do and also if you have a focus area as well. And then we'd, we're going to do some more following up to hear a little bit more about what the day in the okay. community health worker looks like and those challenges that you're seeing in community health centers and integrating in practice. So um, perfect intro. Okay, um, so just a little bit more. Uh, so I do, um, you know, manage their day-to-day -day functions with the six community health workers that report up through me uh, for Eskenazi Health. I help with, um, you know, one doing their, you know, normal HR related duties, but also uh, identifying patients who they should service within those um, community uh, health centers, those patients that they should reach out to with diabetes. Um, and also just being their coach, um, you know, there are times that they're addressed with difficult, uh, not difficult patient in a sense, but just, you know, trying to address social determinants of health can be very challenging. Um, and just being that resource on where to navigate throughout the system or out in the communities, I am that liaison for them uh, for that as well. One of the biggest barriers that I can say that still, you know, is just hard to address is, is uh, when it comes to social determinants of health and um, just addressing patient needs is housing. Uh, it, a lot of our, our, our patients are faced with, as we know now, sometimes eviction, um, some things that are kind of even out of our jurisdiction that we can control um, or they're, you know, they're for whatever reason stop working uh, and just don't have the appropriate income to be able to even afford um, a suitable housing and just finding that housing that fits their income is one of the biggest barriers and challenges that uh, I always still, when my community health workers come to me to address, it's hard to find a resource. Yes, and we know in community health, right, it's not static, it changes over time. Um, so it's incredible that you're there um, cur curating that list and being that um, touch point for your team. Um, Shay, would you like to go next and tell us about your role and uh, the issue area or your focus area? Hi, everybody. How are you? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, thank you for inviting me to the summit. Um, so I am one of the certified community health workers for the um, near west side of Indianapolis. Um, essentially, we focus on different areas, um, as Alicia mentioned, but um, I would say some of the first, one of the first focuses that um, we focus on is setting up home visits um, as well as uh, telephone visits. 
Um, this is so that we can introduce the program and as well as allow the patient to see us face to face and get comfortable with us. Um, and then it also gives us um, an idea of how they're living or what barriers we can identify what barriers they're going through or what you know what they're struggling with. So that way we can try to see how we can tackle those barriers and then get them on the right track to managing their diabetes. Um, we also focus on managing their health care and connect with their primary care providers by communicating with them um, either via email, chat, message, or setting up an actual case conference to talk about the actual patient. Um, we also schedule and coordinate all their medical appointments. Um, and we also follow up to make sure that, you know, they, they do make it. Um, and, you know, just basically help navigating and getting them connected to all the community resources because a lot of them don't know that they have resources out there. Um, and, you know, whether if transportation is one of the barriers, we try to find resources for them to be able to get to and from their medical appointments. Excellent. We know that's one of the key barriers across all types of disease states. Um, so we're going to hear a little bit more about Ashley's work in your issue area. Ashley, you're muted. There we go. Hi, uh, thank you again for this opportunity. Um, as mentioned, my name is Ashley Gervis, and I'm thankful uh, to not only be a resident within North Indianapolis corridor, um, but also serve as executive director for our United Northeast Community Development Corporation. Um, one of the big things, uh, as we see in community development, is that no uh, community can thrive unless we are equitably addressing the gaps um, that are missing. So. One thing, our role um, of primary focus is food access. It's great that we can build infrastructure, but if we are not allowing a good consumption of what we eat and how our residents have access to things that help their lives, um, we're not doing an adequate job as far as development. So we are really thankful uh, to be that of a host site of a community health worker helping us understand the navigations and connections of um, what we do so everyone can thrive together. Now, uh, specifically uh, relative to my role, um, it's a new task, but it's a, a grateful task that we have taken on as far as um, being a supervisor. And hopefully as well, uh, it's a new infused um, component from a community development lens uh, that can maybe help open up and shape new ways of how true ecosystem building, because really that's what we're doing, um, can be transformative and not just transactional with the basic things that we see, as I call bricks and sticks uh, with residential and community building. Excellent, Ashley. I was over here as your corner. I can see why you are now the manager. Um, oh, thank you. Thank you. I'd love to hear more about your work in the issue area if you have one that you're focusing on in your role. Yeah. Um, so, um, I'll. I'm sorry. I, Ron, I just Ron. Oh, no, you broke up, but yes, gotcha. <laughs> thank you. Yes, Ron, if you can share your role with Dippin and your issue area. Sure. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Ron Rice. I'm the community builder for the Near Northwest. Um, that is the Near Northwest is a uh, is a collection of seven neighborhoods, uh, over 50,000 people, uh, six large parks, um, one being the third largest regional park in the country. Um, and uh, I'm kind of the chief networker, um, collaborator, resource finder, um, talker, uh, <laughs> salesman, uh, event planner, you name it. So um, my role has been, I am also a resident. I was born here, moved away for uh, about 25 years, came back. Uh, so I've been back here now since uh, 2001. Um, and uh, my job uh, has been basically uh, input um decision making with as a resident uh for the um initiatives and the uh, uh direction that we want to take uh this diabetes project uh in particular we took a physical fitness uh direction uh which i've kind of been the um 
uh, I don't know what best way to say it, the, the on the ground and running uh, person. So we started uh, uh, hip hop aerobics classes. We started workouts at each one of the parks, uh, in particular the parks, because I wanted to show um, what each park not only has available, but what you could do uh, that you wouldn't normally see, uh, such as functional strength train, uh, functional strength training, um, not just walking, but also exploring, uh, like let's say the, the now closed Riverside Golf Course, uh, getting out there and seeing the art, which means you're going to be walking, which means you're going to be getting in shape. Um, uh, for me, uh, coming as a personal trainer in the past and also an EMT, um, but living in, a, in this in this city all over, when I go to areas that Lisa pointed out were uh, areas that had a higher income, and so they therefore had a lower uh, rate of diabetes, you see a lot more people out walking every day in their neighborhoods, at the parks, um, and doing things. And then here, we don't see it very often. Usually, it's just a gathering or team sports. And so um, I kind of took it upon myself uh, with the help of a lot of the residents and the uh, staff with DIPN to basically uh, get out here and show our parks off. Uh, and so I've been putting out videos every day. Um, uh, our community health worker has been coming out and doing uh, uh, walks with us. Uh, we do our aerobics classes. Uh, I am also a diabetic, so I have already dropped 10 pounds from uh, the start of all this. and. That has been that has led to a lot of discovery of not only uh, how bad my stress was and why I wasn't working out and what was what led me to get diabetes in the first place, but also when I break down and stop working out, how quickly things will turn uh, from the diabetes. And so, and I've been running into a lot of residents who have been able to share that, and actually we're all kind of coming onto a same the same team together to kind of not go through our woes but try to find solutions together so that's basically what i've been doing thank you ron that's incredible and i like that you include the social media aspect um you know sometimes with COVID, it feels isolating mm -hmm. um, to be at home but now we're able to get out and doing it in a safe way together um is incredible that you're working in that way with your community so i'm going to actually go back to ashley and i know that you have a worker that's housed in your org, and that's new. Um, so we'd love to hear more about what the benefits of having CHW has been, um, how you've worked through any challenges with having the CHW to your team, and anything else that you can share, because we know oftentimes when you're integrating into a medical team, that can be a whole nother dynamic for us to take off. Yeah, um, I can tell you, we have been truly thrilled being able to house a community health worker, which really is an overall advocate for quality health being um, within our space. Um, every day, uh, just the amount of energy uh, Summer has, who is our community health advocate, brings to the table, uh, just really helps energize the fact that whatever we do from community development is always making sure we are centering not just the individual, but every dynamic that makes a person whole um, being included in our process. So it's been really great uh, to have that. While also in addition to understanding um, the needs of our community, our dynamics are a little different versus uh, some of the other uh, neighborhoods that are provided where in our community, we do not have an actual direct neighborhood social service provider, such as a multi-service um, entity where you can go get rent and utility assistance. So one of the major benefits, uh, since we don't have that physical structure here yet, that is a uh, goal for our community that we get reestablished, but Summer um, has done an incredible job of being that connector. If she's building the trusted relationship they will now be able to trust whoever is needing and seeking help to be able to go get it. And in particular, um, any of those service aspects has now led to the fact of a, a primary spot of looking at a whole person, which has been great to being able to talk about some of the contributors uh, to diabetes. Um, a good example is this. We uh, were out doing a, a 
community canvas, we do what's called Black Walk. Of course, right now, COVID safety um, is a priority. But to learn that uh, during the conversation, there were some, you know, repair needs that um, were definitely very evident while looking at a home. But once we were able to see uh, that of some of the living conditions started asking, you know, embedding questions, that alone helped through uh, a lens of diabetes, be able to see education referral, but also cl uh, clinical health connection. But most importantly, it wasn't just addressing the primary need of what we saw, but really an overall wraparound uh, source. So going into the question about what does this community clinical partnership looks like, it has honestly helped fill in a critical gap um, which has seen systems that typically have not worked together come together and then being able to help document that has just been uh, excellent um, in transitioning into our other work. Now, um, just briefly, just relative to challenges, um, we are that of a small and mighty team, traditionally alone on the flip side when you think of community development. Um, social services, um, may not be the number one primary thing. Again, we have decided just because of the work of community health advocacy, it brought a whole new lens of how we incorporate the true quality of life. And so some of those challenges being able to work through, understand um, our documentation process, um, being transferable to a clinical lens, take a little bit of time learning lingo and seeing measured impacts across the board. But I am very thankful to say that um, as time goes by, another quarterly report is done, um, we, we see the measured impact. And we also hear that too uh, with measured impact of more residents that are uh, being connected with us and even too taking excitement um, in their new journey of quality health. Um, and one last thing, um, just do relative to time, food access is a critical thing for our community. Uh, while we are really thankful in um, a portion of our Northeast Indianapolis neighborhood where we have a grocery store, there are still many areas without. And so um, building on some of the advocacy the residents have previously said in quality, their quality of life plans, um, they, we show up and we show out. We don't want any more grocery stores because we can look at the contributor factors up there. However, um, it has now um, created this bed of innovation of seeing some of the great restaurants um, that have actually emerged with COVID in creating this new incubation of connecting dots. Uh, we can think of one of uh, the steering committee um, participants, their um, means of like an urban farm. Well, if you have a new restaurant, hey, why can't we think about um, from a dip in lens getting some healthy food now on a, a menu? And it's a win win mutual benefit for more. And we have this story after story of that. So I can't uh, wait to see how our community health worker will be able to further amplify uh, ideas that have come from the steering committee. But as to a great point Patrice talked about, that collective impact. Um, honestly, has been such a major drive of us all still remaining together um, and being able to vision more time and years together um, without some of the major barriers happening in our area of daily. Oh, I love that. I love that. I think it's always a good indicator when a partner, of particularly a multi-partnership that's gone on for five years, at year three and a half is already talking about what's to come in the next year. So um, I, I really, again, kudos to the work that you're doing. Um, but I wanna hear a little bit more about Alicia and the role that the CHW plays in your program and then how they're integrated into your system. And if you can tell us how providers have reacted. Um, I know often with clinicians, uh, you know, it can be a transition, but then they see the benefit um, and it's one of those things where sometimes you learn how to work together and we'd love to hear how you've done it with your system. Sure. Um, so again, we earlier we touched on we have Eskenazi has six community health workers. 
um, that currently work with diabetes patients who reside in one of those targeted uh, neighborhoods. Uh, and again, these neighborhoods have a high prevalence of diabetes. Um, and so what they do is they currently um, meet face-to-face, -face, well, not currently because of COVID. So a lot of our face-to-face our -face has turned into telephone contact. Um, but prior to COVID, we were doing home visits and they meet face-to-face -face with the patients. And a lot of things that they're doing is um, a couple of things. So addressing social determinants of health. So those are like food insecurity, transportation, um, um, housing related issues, things, uh, lack of social support, um, identifying those, uh, those, those needs and then helping the, the patient navigate um, through the, the different community resources. Because a lot of times the patient just are not aware of what's around them or what's in their community. Um, or even what's um, available for them in our organization. Um, and then also they help the patients um, uh, with achieving their self-care management goals. So one of the main ones, the, the first ones that we work with the patients with is making sure that they are keeping their um, scheduled appointments. A lot of times, you know, patients with diabetes are supposed to be seen at least at, at, at minimal twice a year, but normally the provider wants to see them every three months. So getting those patients um, connected and making sure they're keeping those appointments and if they're not identifying what the barriers are. Other self-management goals that they might work with the patient on are, you know, making sure that they're taking their medications daily. You know, are they checking their blood sugar? Do they have meter? Do they have all the supplies that they need? And a lot of times, um, you know, we, the patients will tell us in, at the, the health centers, because I'm a nurse by trade. So I've seen it across the board working with nurses and community health workers. The patients normally will tell us what they we, what we want to hear, but when you go out in the home and you see that uh, that they have a whole year's worth of medication that has not even been touched, um, and so they'll pick it up and don't take it. So uh, there's a lot that we um, we 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 cover or you know uncover when we're out in the home. Um, as far as provider reactions, again, it does take a lot because not even just providers but clinical staff getting the buy-in because. I mean, at any uh, health organization, there are a lot of programs, there are a lot of uh, research studies, a lot of different things that go on. And, you know, they want to do know what's the benefit to us, or is there any extra work on our behalf? Um, and, and so, you know, at first, you know, when I, when I introduced the program, you know, let's, everybody said that's great, but then we may not hear from them. Uh, but I'm like, what, and I, what I uh, explain to the providers and the nurses, don't worry, community health workers are going to contact you. And so um, now, you know, it's been nothing but positive feedback from all sites about how um, thankful and um, just, you know, how helpful the community health workers have been because, again, they're bringing back information that they would not have known that impacts the care and even their treatment plans and what they may need to do back to those sites and are being able to address the patient's um, needs and doing that in a timely manner as well. I mean, there's been some, some um, life-saving measures that have happened with the involvement of community health worker getting to that uh, provider right away and, and saying, here's what uh, is going on, patient bring, bringing the patient in and really saving the lives of some of our patients. So it has been very um, great, great feedback. Um, and, you know, while we're only working in about five sites, additionally, initially it was three health centers. We've kind of expanded to a total of five. I get asked all the time, there's uh, uh, 10 community health centers, when are you coming? <laughs> it's like, when are, when are we going to get a community health worker? So it's really a, a valuable program and help to the science. Well, kudos to you because, you know, I think the power of a medical director and the fact that other ones are saying, when are you coming? That means that um, not only are you making an impact in the patient's life, but you're improving um, the quality outcomes and measures for the health center. Um, and that's not possible, right, without that CHW every day. So we're going to actually hear a little bit more about what does that look like from Shay, um, what's your caseload, and just a little bit more um, about how you feel DIP in has made a difference in a patient or mm -hmm. what you take away as the, the impact that you're able to make. Shay? Sure. So um, a typical caseload for a CHW at this time is roughly about 55 to 65 patients. 
Um, however, our goal is to reach a caseload of 100 patients. So we are almost there. Um, our health providers and community partners as well have supported this program since we first started the DIP-IN program. So they never really hesitate to send us a referral and um, because you know we all want what's best for the patient um, as well as their health um, and addressing any barriers um, the patient may be struggling with. So during the beginning, um, our community health workers follow um, up with patients bi-weekly, like on a bi-weekly basis. However, at times we may need to follow up on a weekly basis. It just depends because the patient may, um, their health may be poorly controlled um, or they, they're just struggling with different barriers that immediately need assistance or need to be follow up with. So once these, once we address these barriers, then we gradually start to, um, you know, schedule them bi-weekly and then follow up. A um, few months later, we will kind of address to see what we've been working on. And then if I feel like um, I can kind of start to see them less or call them less, then typically it goes by like once a month and then so on. So again, each, each patient is different. Um, you know, the follow-up cases are different pretty much for each patient. Um, so how have I made a difference in the lives of dip patients? Well, <clears throat> I would say <clears throat> as a CHW, um, my, my job, depend, it depends on the cultural setting. Um, again, I see a lot of patients. So I found myself working in the underprivileged and marginalized communities where people may um, lack appropriate access to health resources. So um, the community that I primarily work with may have certain cultural or religious beliefs that differ from their um, health options. And additionally, they may not speak English fluently or um, they you know, don't have the means to pay for healthcare. Um, so I tend to play the essential role of helping my, my area's healthcare system and becoming um, more culturally, culturally relevant for the people that I serve and making sure that I'm up to date as well with all the health resources that are out there for them. Um, Secondly, when it comes to healthy lifestyle, I educate my patients and help understand the healthcare, the healthcare system, um, basically just educating them about healthy living. Um, I teach them about their um, health conditions because the goal really is to educate them to become more aware of the importance and uh, devise strategies for dealing with their conditions, um, as well as um, discuss, you know, when can we start that healthy lifestyle change? And lastly, um, I would say improving the communication. Uh, we all know communication can be a huge hurdle, right? So I make sure that my patients understand um, what they're being told from their primary care provider um, before I follow up with them. I'll read the doctor's last visit, like the documentation note, to see if there has been any changes in their medication regimen. Um, once this has been reviewed, then I just simply place a call to the patient and use the teach back method tool, if you've heard of that before, you know, I'll ask them, you know, I just noticed you had a primary care appointment. How did it go? Um, you know, what, what did the, what did your doctor tell you? Um, was there any changes to your medication? So while I have, I have already viewed the documentation note, I just simply want them to feel that they're the ones that are sharing that update with me. Um, I've learned that patients are often too intimidated to admit that, you know, they don't understand what they're being told, or they may feel so lost that they don't even know where to begin to ask questions. So this is where I believe that I make a difference in their lives because they feel empowered and cared for when I follow up with them. And overall, it's just providing that social support. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, you know, I believe CHWs and navigators and lay health workers are really the heart and hands of the work that we do in this space. And I loved what you shared, um, you know, taking that time so that they're building that relationship that they might not get in those 13 minutes, right, in the clinical setting, but you're really able to help um, improve those outcomes. So I'm going to head over to Ron, our chief uh, networker. And we're going to hear a little bit more about what may have surprised him in his time with this project and also um, what would he do differently. But Ron, I wanted to follow up because you mentioned a little bit about how COVID's impacted your work. 
Um, but I also wanted to see if you had any insight on how the recent social justice issues may have impacted your work in community with Dippin and just gain some insight um, on your experience. Ron? Sure. Um, <clears throat> I can speak on COVID first. Um, um, obviously, uh, lockdown happened and everybody was pretty much in. So um, I started to notice myself. Uh, my, I didn't like, I wasn't on lockdown. I had to keep going. Um, so for me and a lot of the partners here, we started to do um, food deliveries. We partnered with Indigo buses uh, so that people wouldn't have to leave their homes. In particular, the seniors, uh, we were trying to make sure the IPS kids uh, who now did not have uh, the meals they would have uh, at school. So we were at a point where we were delivering 1300 meals a week. Um, and the bad side of that was that we clearly saw from the very beginning that the people that we were delivering food to were not food affected because of COVID. This was before COVID. Uh, and that's the reality that kind of hit me hard in the face. Um, the second thing that happened as we were delivering food, we started noticing a lot of the food mainly came uh, from gleaners uh, and bless them for doing uh, giving uh, giving like, like they did. And also from second helpings were not diabetic friendly foods. Uh, there were a lot of high uh, glycemic foods, uh, a lot of uh, starches, a lot of sugar, a lot of candy in those boxes. and I'm not, you know, again, um, uh, better can't be a chooser, but at the same time, we had to become very aware of what we were passing out, who were we passing out to, and uh, in at least some type of instruction. So it was one of the first things that I was able to get was uh, from one of the uh, nurses with the, uh, that's involved with dip in uh, was a list of foods and some do's and don'ts uh, that we can give to people. Um, so that was initially some of the things that I noticed. Then I think the next thing I was um, uh, taken aback from was how many people thought like me. So I'll be honest, I was a bad diabetic. I'm working my way out of that, but I was a bad diabetic. I did not eat right. Uh, I did not take my metformin when I was supposed to back when they gave it to me. Um, and I started to notice as I was meeting people, talking with them, uh, that they were exactly the same. And uh, which basically just leads to not only your own health getting worse, but then you're teaching those habits to your kids, to your spouse. And you're basically, if you want to call something being genetic, well, it, uh, or hereditary, it's because we're passing along um, habits that um, are not good. So me getting out there, and other folk getting out there and getting behind the camera, getting out there and working out um, was key and starting that change. Um, I think the biggest thing that I tried to do in the videos that I did because of COVID was to uh, be extremely honest with everybody. Uh, and um, I spoke a lot about not only the workout and either it was how hard or how easy it was getting, but also what my diet was like and why I felt low um, on on days I worked out and I would uh, attribute it mainly to the food I ate um, and uh, not just the workout. Um, and that started to have a big effect on a lot of folks when people started coming to the, aerob the hip hop aerobics classes and started coming to the walks, they were starting to share that same information. And again, no, I didn't, I didn't, or we didn't fix their diabetes, but we started that talk that needed to happen and uh, started that kind of tribe that we created w amongst ourselves to uh, share and to open up about, you know, uh, some of the pitfalls that we've had. So that those have been some of the issues, the social um, um, ram uh, ramifications from what's happened over the summer. Honestly, the, the biggest thing that I noticed was that people becoming more aware of the bias that they receive from their doctors being a minority. I've had quite a few, um, especially in particular black female um, uh, residents who have said, you know what, I need to change my doctor. Uh, and if, you know, on things that weren't even diabetes related, but just think about if, you know, that being true, 
how many things, how many people are being uh, ignored or not being uh, diagnosed correctly uh, because of uh, the bias that's that's put on them um, from their doctors or nurses or whatnot. So that was probably one of the eye-opening things. And I've been able to talk to some of our healthcare providers about, you know, is there a chain of command or is there um, uh, a process that I can give to people so that when they have those kind of issues, you know, we're not going back and forth with email this and call that. This is who we talk to. This is who's going to get it done. Uh, these are the doctors that um, that will not give you those kind of issues, uh, things like that. Um, so overall, I think those two, COVID and the social uh, injustice uh, uh, that's been happening, uh, have had a huge uh, effect on on what we do. But you know, my attitude is adapt and overcome. I'm ex-military. So, you know, you find a way around, you find a way to work with it, through it or over it. Uh, and so, you know, we've got a lot of warriors that came out. And the good thing is too, uh, on a side note was that we were able, because we've been highlighting the park so much, we've actually created interest from residents and partners to start taking over uh, like a friends groups of these parks and start finding ways to fund these underfunded parks, uh, whether it's a cleanup, whether it's uh, funding to fix new equipment, whether it's to transform an entire park, um, that's been one of the benefits of it so that it will be more inviting. Uh, people feel more safe. They do now, and us being out there, it's created a level of safety that I think wasn't there before, but now it's starting to get real big. I love going to um, not just Watkins Park in our area, but I love going to Charlie Wiggins Park in the morning because it's uh, it's not an indie park, it's a community park. A lot of people don't know about it. Uh, and now people are seeing it and they're talking about it. Uh, and that's that's important to that neighborhood. Yes, I'm giving you a shout out, Patrice, uh, to that neighborhood, but also too, to the community as a whole because we can't do this. It can't just be one entity controlling everything like the parks. It has to be all those community driven uh, goals and uh, initiatives like Charlie Wiggins Park has been uh, thought up, taken care of, and uh, maintained by not only Lily and IU uh, and Eskenazi, but but mainly because from the residents of that neighborhood. So you know, giving it recognition, giving it uh, some uh, some face time, uh, has been really important. Uh, and then that's um, I'm starting to see at all the parks more people coming to do things in a park that they normally wouldn't do. It didn't have to be what I did but they're coming out more and being outside more. So that's not only helping with their physical fitness, but it's also helping with their stress. No one wants to be, you're not gonna get healthy sitting in your house all the time. So get outside, get moving, see nature, yada, yada, yada. So anyway, that's what I got. That was excellent, Ron. Thank you for your vulnerability. Um, you know, if we don't talk about it, then we can't be about it. And it's excellent that you're doing that at the community level, but also empowering the patients. Um, we got a question in the Q&A, so I'm going to invite anyone else to go ahead and submit your questions to the Q&A box. Uh, we're going to start with the first one. Uh, do you have any resources? I know that one was shared um, from the study that Courtney mentioned in the chat, so if you get a chance, you can click out there. Um, but are there educational resources that you've developed that you can share with other community partners? And um, we can put those in the chat or get those to NNQF to share those with their residents as well. And specifically um, in the nutrition information, I know Ron just um, highlighted some of those best practices. So anyone have anything that they'd like to bring um, to this discussion that other community leaders should be trying? So I would say that we could circulate afterwards some of that, those do's and don'ts that were circulated to Ron related to the food boxes. Um, we don't, I don't have them at my fingertips, but we could send that out to folks if they were interested in that. I think that would be excellent because that, I mean, I actually um, wrote that down globally as one of the key takeaways. You know, I think people always think if you build it, they'll come, but also, you know, everything's not a fit for every patient. Um, and particularly we know with comorbidities, uh, you may be dealing with a patient that's diabetic that has other disease considerations. Um, so it's great that you've been able to educate people that we appreciate that you're trying to step up during COVID, but here's how to best help our community. Um, that's incredible. Uh, I know that I didn't see another question come through, so I'm going to actually ask one because we are getting close to the end of time. 
And this is just gonna be a quick round robin to close out and then I'll share some closing thoughts. If you could, um, in your work with community partnership, whether it be with Dippin um, or just best practices with community partners, is there one thing that you'd like to leave um, today's audience with um, that they should take or consider as a best practice in their work? So if anyone wants to unmute and share, we can kind of go um, across. Lisa, I don't know if you wanna start as the PI. Sure, thanks. Um, I would say best practices is involved multiple partners from different sectors and at an equal or higher level is to listen to the resident voices. So that would be my best practice. Excellent. Alicia, are you leaning in to unmute? Would you like to share yours next? Sure. Um, my best practice would be to look at the possibility of including that community health worker within your organization. Um, we've Eskenazi has had community health workers working in, in various programs. Um, I started in 2013, way before I even started. So, um, you know, over 13 years of working with um, care coordinators or community health workers that go out into the home, you'll see that it brings a lot more feedback and information that you need to help treat your patients and just someone to be able to build that relationship with the patient. Uh, to help them improve their health outcomes it is very beneficial. Thank you, Alicia. And before I go to Shay, I'm actually going to insert mine here. Um, I think this is a great example of what Eli Lilly has done, but not only uh, in, invest in the community health worker programs, we need to make sure that we're investing in um, not just innovation, but sustainability. Um, yeah. because programs like this, if they only happen for two or five years, you're going to see a flip. And then we're going to be looking at the same barriers again and issues. So we challenge those funders on the call to help give us the money to make that mission. All right, Shay. Can you guys hear me? Okay. So I would say um, best practice, you know, I, I got to piggyback off Alicia. I think that it would definitely, um, it's important to implement this program in all of our community health centers, um, and maybe not just our community health centers, but really all around the city. Um, Cause I believe that community health work is definitely beneficial to, 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 to anybody really. So I just, you know, definitely, I feel like hopefully we can expand this program and we can really do this for like the next 20 years. <laughs> I love that. And we actually just got a question in the box. So I'm going to kick it over to Courtney because this is one for you and you can give a tip if you'd like. Um, is Lily, Eli Lily looking at investing in other communities for this dip in model? Um, I guess it would be dip um, in another community. Yeah, <clears throat> so that's a great question. And I can actually <clears throat> answer your previous question on, on um, <clears throat> what is a, a key takeaway and that can transition in, into this. <clears throat> Pardon me, but to piggyback off of what Lisa said, that the key Lee learning, the key learning from this is multi-sector partnership, private sector, public sector, academic sector, um, partnering with the community, letting the community lead um, is the biggest learning from this. And I think that gets to the sustainability piece of this that you were just talking about, that we don't want this to be done in five years. We want this to continue for 20 years. And I think if you <clears throat> let the community lead this, that gets to the sustainability piece. Um, at Lilly, our, our ultimate goal with um, all of our global health partnerships and DIPIN is to, um, if we let the communities lead, then the ultimate goal is to expand that work and make it bigger because I, I completely agree. Um, five years and seven million dollars, if you don't lay the ground the groundwork to make it sustainable, is um, then we're just back at at square one. So our ultimate goal um, is to make this sustainable in these three neighborhoods, um, to ultimately scale up in other parts of the city of, of Indianapolis, and then ultimately. Um, you know, expand to, to other cities where where the life expectancy disparity um, looks like it does in Indianapolis. Excellent. Dippin may be coming to a city near you if you're on the line. Definitely follow up. 
Um, we're gonna check with Patrice, if you could quickly give us your last and then we'll go to Ashley and Ron and we'll close out. So Patrice. Right. Sorry. So I think um, a takeaway from for me for this program is that um, having your resident voice and helping your partners uh, be it if they want to help and how and being engaged and they can be eager, helping them frame your message for your community. So it's it's one thing to be able to give the funding, but you also need to be an advocate as well. So giving them and teaching them that peace is really important. And then for me uh, personally as a resident is really understanding the systemic issues that we have in our community and changing those um, issues from disparities into you know a potential successes. So because of the unjust uh, things that are happening in this in the city and in our in our world right now, it's really important for us to take hold of that and really be able to have a voice and make sure that our messages is changing for the future. So, yes, Ashley. Yeah, um, I echo all of the previous thoughts being said, and um, I think one important thing we really got to consider, especially in cross sector partnerships. Um, I always say all progress moves at the speed of trust. Um, trust um, includes being able to, one, know there may be some barriers uh, to feel like when dealing with maybe as someone of a, like a financial funding community, talking with residents or learning the voices of the steering committee, take time, have patience of understanding you are all trying to get to some shared understanding and commitment uh, to improving the health and well-being of a neighborhood. And to echo off of that, that be okay of having those intentional conversations when it comes to gathering data and seeing that you can be trustworthy and transparent as how that data is being used. Mm -hmm. All plays a major part mm -hmm. and ultimately keeping everybody aligned with those long-term goals. So we can see incredible projects like this, as mentioned before, hit um, every neighborhood, hit every state, um, but also to hit um, the disparate um, things so life can be prolonged equitably across the board. Yeah. Excellent. So Ron? I'm in a bad position because the last three people said exactly what I wanted to say. <laughs> Courtney said something uh, about communities. I'm like, okay, well, fine. I'll talk about <laughs> neighborhoods. And then Patrice hit on that. And I can't do that. And then I was going to say, well, what about trust? And then Ashley hits on that. So, you know, I don't know how I feel about being last, but here goes. Um, I would say this. Uh, being a diabetic, uh, being a minority, living in a uh, low income area, uh, it's important that you hear us. Mm. If you don't do anything else, all the money in the world doesn't mean anything. And all the intentions in the world don't mean anything if you do not listen to someone like me or someone like my neighbor or someone across the street that may not look like me, but may be going through something similar to that. And we're all in this together. Uh, I see way too many organizations, corporations want to come in and be the savior, or they want to come in and sympathize, but they're not empathizing. And it's really important that we, as caregivers, as organizations, as funders, as uh, recipients, as um, uh, people who uh, put their input in, we have to we have to start listening more and walking in their shoes. Uh, I'm, I said earlier, I'm a diabetic who was a bad diabetic, you know, and but now I'm on the other side trying to get other people to step up like I'm stepping up. But I had to stop and come down and see where they were at. Uh, and if we don't start doing that more, not on just diabetes, but on so many other things, uh, we're going to be missing the mark. So I, that's what I have since y'all stole what I my thoughts, but it's all good. <laughs> That's when you know the panel's good, right? Nice. And saleable moments. So I just want to say thank you. Um, as we wrap up, I know NNQF empowers us to leave um, kind of those key themes. And I wanted to give you the opportunity to close out with those. Um, but what really struck me was the concepts of investing, adapting, and overcoming. I think we all can um, understand as we go back to our communities for COVID that that's key. Um, I loved what was shared about all progress moves at the speed of trust. And I think that goes back to investment. It might be dollars, but it also could be time to build those trusted relationships and partners. 
And finally, hear us, right? Um, not only don't do anything about us without us, but hear us as well. Um, so thank you again for your insight, your time, and we look forward to seeing Dippin expand um, based off the incredible work that you've done. We thank National Minority Equality Forum, and um, we're excited to close out this panel. If you are looking for more resources, um, we will be sharing those, and I'll put up the screen for Dippin so you can actually see how to email them. So I'll do that as we close out and take care. So again, for more information about the Dippin Project, visit diabetes.iupi.edu. And thank you. Have a great evening, everyone. I want to thank you. And thank you, Sharia, for being a great um, moderator. Oh, you made it easy. This was excellent. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing and hand it over to National Minority Equality Forum.